evening, everyone. For her party. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. All right, welcome. It is Monday, October 24th, 2022. This is the School Board Awards and Presentations. We are meeting in the Joanne Idolette Junior Teacher Education Center, and it is 5.30. We'll bring this meeting to order. Um, I will turn it over to Dr. Moore. Thank you, Madam Chair. We do have a number of presentations for our 5.30 session, and we will begin uh, our first presentation with Ms. Maddox. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight for awards and presentations. Our first presentation is our Casual for a Cause presentation. Last month, our district, we raised money for the Hope for Family Center. And for those of you who are not familiar with Casual for a Cause, it's when our students, teachers, and staff members are able to exchange a donation um, to dress casually for a day. And last month, we raised a total of $2,692.62. For the Hope for Family Center. And I understand that. <laughs> and I understand that we have Marty Mercado, the executive director, here to accept the check. And friends. <laughs> I'm the picture taker, so you come up here. <laughs> here you are. Would you like to say a few words? Sure. Here, I'll let you guys hold it. Hello, so can you guys hear me? I'll go up on my toes. So I'm Marty Mercado, I'm the executive director, and we're a shelter for families. So the criteria for our home is that you have to have children. You can be a single parent, you can be a grandparent, you just have to have somebody under the age of 18. Right now our shelter's full, and the sad number is that we have 108 families waiting to get in. I'll say it one more time, 108 families to get in. So we are a privately funded organization. We do receive a small grant from the county, but we are privately funded. We have, we rolled through last year 162 individuals and our goal is to help them be sustainable. We do that through education, getting them involved in school with their children, having them go out to the college. We teach them literacy, financial literacy. We work with their health, their mental health, as well as set goals for possible home ownership, which is a little bit of a difficult time right now. But we work really, really hard. Ray is our director of social services, so he works directly with our families. And Lydia is our marketing manager slash volunteer manager slash do it all. So, <laughs> yes, and picture taker. So we really appreciate it, we work hard. And our children are the most important part of the shelter to us. And those of you that provide education to our children are some of the most important people in their lives. They may not be able to get through every day without a tear in their eye, but what they do say to us is how great school is and what a, tr a transformation is made to them by the teachers in this county. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that is all yours. Just don't take it to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Next, I would like to introduce Miss Pamela Dampierre. She is going to um, introduce someone else and talk about our PBIS Model School Award presentation. You see, we have several people lined up over here on the wall tonight. It's a very exciting night. And we would like to recognize each one of these schools. Ms. Dampier? Thank you. Appreciate it. Good evening. We're thrilled to recognize schools that have achieved positive behavior uh, interventions and support model school status. And we have about 14 schools who have, who have achieved this great honor. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lewis, our Director of Student Services, and her team to present the award to schools. Good afternoon. Before I get started, I wanted to make a special 
thank you to Ashley Dowdell and Claudia Navarro for the work that has taken place for our PBIS recognition of schools. And I want to uh, make sure that that is put out there in terms and just give them that kudos for coordinating all of this work that has taken place uh, district-wide. Our district is excited to celebrate 14 schools who have been recognized by the Florida PBIS project as a PBIS model school for 2021-2022 school year. The schools who have earned this distinction are being recognized for successful implementation of a school-wide PBIS framework that intentionally and positively impacted students. Schools applied to receive one of four awards, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Platinum is the newest and highest award that can be earned. Claudia Navarro, our PBIS district coordinator, will be distributing awards to recognize schools for this achievement. I'm gonna turn it over to Claudia. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. I am so excited to be here celebrating this amazing achievement with these schools tonight. Positive Behavior Interventions and Support, PBIS, is a school-wide framework that, according to national research, enhances student quality of life and reduces problem behaviors. By establishing this framework, we are developing skills, making changes to the school environment, acknowledging appropriate behaviors, and using data to identify supports for our students. The criteria for platinum requires schools to engage in the problem-solving process for students requiring tier two and tier three levels of behavioral supports. The following schools are being recognized for achieving platinum. Dodger Town Elementary. Indian River Academy. <laughs> Liberty Magnet School. <laughs> Sebastian River Middle School. Vero Beach Elementary. <laughs> Wabasso School. <laughs> the criteria for gold requires schools to engage in the problem solving process. If I could, um, just a shameless plug. Uh, Daniel Laverack, wait, wait, raise your hand. Danya. Danya, I don't know, I can't read, hold on. Danya. Danya Laverack, that's exactly what this paper says. Um, Florida School Counselor of the Year for the- uh, Woohoo! Yeah. Quickly, she's going to come back in December, and we're going to do this uh, appropriately. But she literally got this information last Wednesday, Thursday, yes. and then we saw her on Twitter uh, uh, announcing it. So we're going to come back and give you the proper props that you you so rightfully deserve. Congratulations. Thank you. We love you, Dania. <laughs> The criteria for gold requires schools to engage in the problem-solving process for students requiring tier two level of behavioral supports. The following schools are being recognized for achieving gold. Felsmere Elementary. <laughs> IR Prep. Just two? Come in this 
center. Congratulations. The criteria for bronze requires schools to provide tier one level behavioral support school wide. The following schools are being recognized for achieving bronze. Beachland Elementary. <laughs> Glendale Elementary. <laughs> Osceola Magnet School. Oslo Middle School. <laughs> Sebastian Elementary School. <laughs> Sebastian River High School. Congratulations to all. Congratulations, everyone. We're so proud of all of our schools. A couple weekends ago, we held our second annual School Choice Expo at the IRSC Mueller Center. Was anyone able to attend it's in the audience here? Yes, go staff. Woo! <laughs> All of our schools in our district de departments were in attendance. Some were featuring engaging activities related to their unique program opportunities, and our community partners were in attendance as well to support and distribute their information regarding their own organizations. Student performances were had from multiple schools. They were amazing. These included cheerleading, dance, vocal, instrumental, and dramatic performances. Huge thanks to Cindy Emerson and her team. And <laughs> for coordinating such a huge event, and at University State College for partnering with the school district to bring this event to life. So now we have a video just kind of encapsulates the weekend for you. Roll it. On October 8th, the school district of Indian River County partnered with Indian River State College to host our second annual school choice and community extravaganza. Every single administrative team came and shared their unique offerings that they have for school choice. And we had over 300 students participating in performances that took place throughout the day. We also had presentations taking place with an expert panel on exceptional student education. Over 30 community partners came and we were able to share resources and what's available for our families to partake in. The School Choice Fair is such an important event because we have such unique offerings at each and every school across Indian River County. So today was the opportunity really to open up the, the doors to the School District of Indian River County. So we have 22 schools here, all kind of highlighting their themes, the education they provide to their students, what is unique about them. So it's an opportunity for all of our community to come in and say, which school is the best fit for my son, my daughter? So it's an opportunity really to explore and matching that child to that particular school is really powerful. It was such a collaborative experience and we are so grateful for everyone across Indian River County that came. We had a record turnout and cannot wait until our third annual event next year. So thank you to all of our community partners, Indian River State College and Mr. Nafziger from Indian River Charter High School for emceeing our student performances. Dr. 
more, that's all we have for presentations. Thank you. And I just want to once again restate the extravaganza was absolutely outstanding. It really brought teaching and learning to life across our entire school district to see so many different unique initiatives taking place. Uh, we packed that place out. The performances were absolutely outstanding. Ms. Emerson, uh, you outdid yourself in terms of pulling all of that together. So thank you for doing that for our community. It's a wonderful presentation. And Madam Chair, that concludes our presentations. Okay, we are ad adjourned at 546.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It is Monday, October 24th, 2022. This is the business meeting for the School District of Indian River County. It is 6 o'clock. I'm calling this meeting to order. We are meeting in the Joe N. Idolette Jr. Teacher Education Center. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and thank you to Sebastian River High School's Navy Junior ROTC under the direction of Lieutenant Commander LCDR James Landis, USN retired, and Master Sergeant um, Michael Hussey, USMC retired. Thank you. All righty. Uh, adoption of the orders of the day. Board members, before I ask for that, um, Superintendent. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Two items. In the policies that are being approved tonight, I'd like to pull policy 9200. That is the policy around volunteers. There's some cleanup language that I'd like to propose to you and discuss with you prior to final approval of that policy. And I also would like to request moving the superintendent's report immediately following the adoption of the orders today for a special recognition. Okay. Um, board members, also, I would like to pull item 10A, approval resolution for property cell phone tower anything else board members uh, I have a question for dr. Moore the salary schedule do you need to make an announcement for that or has that no, th through the chair that we have updated that policy I emailed the board but for the public's un understanding it's just the ones moving to the required minimum wage or have the opportunity to discuss proposed ratifications of salaries uh, for employees over the course of the next uh, week with board members okay Okay, could I ask for a motion to accept the adoption of the orders so of the moved. day as, as amended? Second. <laughs> okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, 5 0. With that, it's time for a citizen input. Oh, I'm sorry, special in presentation. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This is a special moment because we have the opportunity to acknowledge one of our board members who has spent the last four years in service to our community, to our teachers, and ultimately to our students. Dr. Mara Schiff uh, made the decision not to run again for office, but the impact that she has had over the four, last four years has been absolutely significant. In no other time in the history of public education has the last four years been so um, so many new challenges and obstacles in which a board had to deal with. And I say that, and I'm quoting you as I say that. Um, you will say that you removed a superintendent, you hired an interim superintendent, you hired a new superintendent, you hired 
a uh, new school board attorney, and oh, by the way, there was a pandemic uh, which changed the, pu the face of public education drastically. And I can tell you, and I appreciate you in a way that um, truly speaks to your willingness to advocate for absolutely all students, uh, from regardless whether they were in the Sebastian area, which is the district in which you represent, or all the way at Indian River Academy, you were advocating for all students. Uh, I think some of the work that you've done around counseling in the secondary space is truly a game changer for our system. The college, navigating the college and post-secondary experiences, those were some of the initiatives that you advocated for that we now have created, uh, have in place. Some of the mental wellness uh, work that you have pushed uh, really had helped change and create uh, new ways of work for this school system. Personally, I cannot thank you enough for being one of the, well, all the board members voted me for when I got here, um, for, for bringing, me, bringing me here, supporting me over the course of the last three years. It has been an absolutely hard time uh, to navigate such a crazy time across the United States of America, uh, but with someone like you who is always advocating for children and willing to listen to everyone's perspective to find the best solution for students, I cannot thank you enough on behalf of this cabinet, of our principals, of our students. Thank you very much. I don't know where you would hang this on your wall at your house, but the good news is this, this comes off. And you can use it at any time, but this is just a, a, a sh small shine of appreciation for the work that you have done as a school board member for our county here in Indian River. So thank you very much. I'm going to come over here and give you that. I was just going to say, uh, Dr. Schiff, would you like to have a few words? Um, yes, and yeah, I guess I'll, I'll say that now. I can. Uh, bleh, sorry, I'm a little flummoxed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I guess I'll make comments now. Um, you know, these last. It's funny. I, you don't know what's on this paper, but you just said half of it, which sorry, is interesting. Sorry. Um, but the last four years have really been extraordinary. They've, it's been one of the most extraordinary journeys of my life, and I am eternally grateful for getting to serve in this office, getting to serve this district, um, this county, these students. And it is the job from which I have probably grown more than any other job I've held. Um, as many of you know, I've been a college professor for nearly 30 years now. And I think I've learned more in four years of this job um, than in decades on that one. Um, I had no idea when I started this that we would go through three superintendents, a chief financial officer, an entire finance department, and yeah, the global pandemic. Um, can't forget that. And then to top it off, what I also had no idea was that formerly sleepy little school boards in sleepy little towns like Indian River County would suddenly become the center of the culture wars um, in the country, and in the state, um, locally, nationally, internationally. And so while my time in this position, and I'm going to take a few minutes here, Mrs. Barenboer, because I will never sit in this seat again. Um, so this is it, and I'm going to use my few moments. Um, but this, this position, it hasn't always been fun. It hasn't always been enjoyable. It hasn't always been uplifting. At many times, it's been hard, and I've had to make decisions in areas that weren't always what I personally wanted, but what I thought were in the best interests of this district and of the students in this district, irrespective of my personal position on a matter. Um, and there's no hiding out in this job. You don't, you don't get to hide out. You don't get to abstain from voting. You don't get to recuse yourself. You don't get to not be really clear on exactly who you are and what you stand for and make that really, really public. So if you can't do that, this isn't the job. Um, it has to come from your values. It has to come from your heart. And it has to come from your principles. 
And so in that, many folks have no idea. Many folks will like what you do. Many folks will not like what you do. Um, and many folks have no idea of the facets involved in making some of these decisions and the information that we have, both from citizens, from the district, from a variety of different places that inform those decisions. We don't get to vote based on what we want or what a parent wants or what a group of parents wants. What we have to do is represent 15,000 students and 2,000 employees. And those decisions affect not only those 17,000 people, but also their parents and their families and everyone connected with them in this community. So what we represent and what we do here has dramatic impacts in this county. This is not what's on this page, just so you know. <laughs> um, but despite all of that, what I have felt to be my job here is to represent the needs and interests of people and communities and students that are not always represented. I think that's the job of a school board member. I think it doesn't matter simply what I think. I think it matters that I make sure what everybody thinks is heard and is represented. And so despite some of the nasty things that have been said about me in public spaces and in private spaces and in social media, media, I am actually really proud of the fact that not one negative word has been written about me in the press in the four years I've been here. The press has actually been very kind to me. Um, and I've done my best to represent the voices that aren't heard, that aren't seen, and it has taught me the difference in this job between opinion and opinion without responsibility and having to stand by what you value and having to be publicly responsible and publicly visible for your values, your views, your voice, and your vote. There aren't many jobs that are like that. So that said, I've actually loved it. I have loved every minute in this job. Uh, it hasn't always been fun, but it has been one of the greatest honors of my life to serve in this position, to serve this community. And what I hope as I leave is that this community can see its way clear to supporting rather than shaming one another. I hope that this community can find ways to work together and represent those with different experiences, those who have different values, that the purpose of a public board is to represent a broad spectrum of voice and value and opinion. That's the job here. The job is not for us all to have the same voice and all to have the same values. If that's who we were, this board could not get its job done. And so I hope that as we move forward, um, that we will work together to create a tapestry of inclusion and representation and achievement and, and decrease the volatile and to toxic environment that has often come into this boardroom, and rather instead find a way to work together, to find, and I hope, um, what I really hope, and we're almost at the end, just so you know, what I really hope is that everybody hearing this right now understands that no action you take, no voice you use, only happens in that one space. Who you show up as here is who you show up as everywhere. The voice you use here is the voice you use everywhere. And what's important about that is that sometimes we're the last to realize that about ourselves. Sometimes we don't quite realize that we are the ones, we right now are the voice of the children who are watching us. So please understand as we move through these times, remember that you are role models for the children in this county, in this district. You are raising the next generation of leaders. We are crafting leadership in this county. And it is our job, our behavior will be their guide in public and private spaces. So please choose carefully and remember that the children are always watching you. Thank you for the honor of serving you for these last four years. If you Any other board members like to speak? Dr. Jones. Just a short message, Dr. Ship. Um, I think I told you when you first came here that my colleague and very good friend, Mr. Wilson, told me that you will just love working with Dr. Ship. I didn't know you, you didn't know me. And I said, okay, coach, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, I've enjoyed this experience working with you. Your compassion and your commitment to all students 
is a level that every board member should have. You always brought us back to the child because you were the one board member who had a child in school. I could say something from 10 years ago, but it's not the same. Your depth of knowledge and education is so very clear and you express it in a way that people understand. Uh, I know your next journey is going to be very exciting and whoever is able to work with you in any manner will be very, very lucky. And I just want to say good luck and we'll miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. With them, uh, Madam Chair. Oh, oh I'm oh, sorry. No, I, I just wanted to say that, that any, any group of folks, any board uh, is stronger when you have people with different points of view. Uh, you start off maybe not agreeing. Uh, you come from different places. We all have different backgrounds. But the key to successful uh, functioning boards is that you listen respectfully. Um, you always learn from one another. And ultimately, the decisions that are made, particularly the difficult decisions, ought to have a little bit of everybody's point of view in them. And certainly, uh, you, I won't say that, that you have a different point of view, but you're you. We all have different points of view. We all have similar values, but yet different values. We all put certain uh, priorities on certain things, less on others. And the board is, is better off for having your input, and, and I, for one, appreciate it. Thank you for, for what you've done. Thank you. OK, I, I'd just like to add, um, we haven't always agreed on things. Um, sometimes we are on the opposite ends on um, our opinions on how we should vote. But I will say you're willing to listen. Um, you've always been very professional um, and respectful to me. So I really appreciate that. And I wish you the very best. I'm a little jealous of what you're getting to do. But um, I, I think you're going to enjoy it very much. And uh, thank you for serving. OK. I do have two other um, recognitions. I want to acknowledge Dr. Jones, who on, on two different acknowledgments. One, first, the FSBA has uh, selected her as one of seven board members to serve on their targeted strategic advocacy ad hoc committee members. So to represent one of seven across the entire state of Florida, really to look at um, what are the strategic issues FSAB, FSBA would be looking at from a national level it is an acknowledgment. And also, Dr. Jones has been nominated by one of our teachers, uh, music educator Ms. Sherry uh, St. Petery, and she was nominated to be one of the, uh, the, two, the 2023 Florida Music Association Board Member of the Year, and she was, in fact, selected. So she will represent uh, all board members as the 2023 Florida Music Association Board Member of the Year. So congratulations, Doc, on that acknowledgment. Um, and those are my presentations. Congratulations. Okay. With that, we're moving to citizen input. Um, I'm going to read the guidelines. So each statement made by a member of the public shall lim be limited to three minutes in duration. Persons will be recognized in the order in which the requests were received. The time shall start when the speaker is at the podium and the school board attorney will be the official timekeeper. You will hear a beep at the end of your three minutes. Persons may speak for up to three minutes at the beginning of the business meeting during citizen input as indicated on the order of business and for up to three minutes to each action item during the action agenda and each board member discussion item as indicated on the order of business. Persons may only speak once about their given item. The time period may be extended by the presiding officer and only the individual submitting the speaker's form is allowed to address the board. Time may not be yielded to other speakers. During the meeting, please refrain from clapping or outbursts of any sort so we can proceed with dignity and decorum by not infringing on any individual's First Amendment rights. I need to remind everyone to direct all comments to the chairman, not to individual board members or to the superintendent. Board members may or may not address any citizen input statements at the end of all citizen input comments. As board members listen to citizens without interruption, citizens are asked to give board members the same respect. As per Florida Statute 1001.372, subsection 3, the presiding officer of any district school board may order the removal from a public meeting held by the district school board of any person interfering with the expeditious or orderly process of such meeting. 
provided such officers first issued a warning and continued interference with the orderly process of the meeting will result in that re removal. All right, first speaker up is Thomas Kenny. On deck is Jamie Parker. Good evening. I'm here tonight to comment on the workshop meeting exchange on 9-12-2022 between Jackie Rosario and Terry Berenborg. This came after a presentation about curriculum in the view of the new H.R. 1467 law that went into effect July 1st, 2022. There is no need to get a clarification from the Florida Department of Education regarding, quote, what is age appropriate, as Ms. Berenborg suggests. Her claim that the law does not define it is irrelevant if the book already contains pornography. As the Florida State House analysis of the bill clearly states on page nine, the bill provides consistency for selecting library materials within each district by requiring each district school board to adopt and post on its website procedures for developing library material and other media allocations. The procedures must, and I'll only quote the first bullet, require that the book selections must be free of pornography and prohibited materials harmful to minors, suited to student needs, and appropriate for grade level and age group. This language mimics statute 1006.43D. Mrs. Berenborg said she read the bill but has to consult with the representative girl as to what is, quote, age appropriate. However, based on the legal analysis, of the Florida House as an elected member, Mrs. Graw would have obviously agreed to the legislative reasoning and maybe informed the analysis since she is the author of the original parental rights legislation. Furthermore, Mrs. Berenborg's husband, Ed, is Graw's legislative aide and he would thoroughly understand the representative's position. The answer has been stated clearly. To segregate out age appropriate as an overriding question by the chair is either being political or as an author of eight books stating, I do not understand the meaning of the conjunction and in proper English. The House analysis requirement is also consistent with 1006.28 statute, which refers to the same 1006.43D, and the presentation for the adoption of 2520 that was given prior to the discussion at the 912 workshop. 1006.28, section 4D, school library media services, establishment and maintenance, point 2A says, require that book selections meet the criteria in 1006.4. I'm not gonna go into the uh, other thing, but I'm just gonna go on. Um, the presentation talked about choosing textbooks, and they did not use grade level and age group, as it says in 1006.31. That is because it is understood when choosing textbook curriculum or major tool instruction, it is clearly used for each grade level and age group associated with it. The selection of library books is not different because these materials are support materials for the six areas of instructional focus. If you go back to the House legal analysis, the three other bulleted requirements and the reasoning of the House speak directly to the educational value of materials in the selection process. Thank you. I Jamie Parker is next. I will email these to you. Thank you. Jennifer Pippen is on deck. Tonight I would like to address the information that has been circled through a few schools in the district regarding school board policy 9200, which to my understanding reflects the requirements of volunteers and chaperones within the school. The notice I'm referring to specifically states that anyone that would like to be a chaperone or volunteer must pay $92.75 at the parent's expense for fingerprinting and drug screening prior to being able to participate. What about those that can't afford it? Does this mean their child is unable to attend or participate? Upon further research, it seems there's some upcoming revisions to Florida Statute 435.12, the Care Provider Background Screening Clearinghouse, effective 1123, which seems to be driving some of the communication or lack thereof. However, the bigger concern is when did we go to the extreme of requiring fingerprinting and drug, drug screening? The district already goes through a background checking project process using radar. Isn't that enough? I mean, think about it. A lot of jobs these days don't require fingerprinting or drug screening. Why as parents, grandparents, and community members are we required to do that to participate in our own children's lives? If someone doesn't pass this requirement as, re 
a state requirement to, to report to the DCF. Are you guys required to report that? A school continues, to, the school continues to ask how we can get more parent involvement, but really it is feeling more like another way to gain control and take away my right as a parent. We can go in a million different directions with the pros and cons, however, it seems a little contradictory to me when we can't remove sexually explicit books from a library, but you want me to get fingerprinted and drug testing in the same process? So I'm asking you guys tonight for a few things to come out of this. As a school board, I'm asking that you review all school board policies and state statutes that reflect information around requirements for volunteers and chaperones addressing this requirement. What is the ultimate goal here? I'm also asking that the communication practices for items such as this are addressed and reviewed. The inconsistencies within the school district is very troubling. Not only is this situation communicated, many other things have been communicated differently and some schools not at all. What is going on? It starts from you guys all the way down. With that said, I'm not an expert in school board policies or state statutes, but I'm charging the school board to review the policy as well as the communication practices to better, case, to better educate us all and make sure the communication is being sent out in a consistent fashion. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Jennifer Pippen is next. Michael Marsh is on deck. I have a copy of an email that to be passed out to you, please. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Pippin and I'm the chairman for Moms for Liberty Indian River, Florida and one of the co-founders for We the People Indian River County. It has come to our attention that Jennifer Freeland and the teachers union didn't even interview all candidates before endorsing school board candidates in this election cycle. We found this out from an email to the teachers union and asking candidates that weren't endorsed if they were interviewed. It shouldn't be partisan politics in our school district. In an email we found via a public records request on August 4th that was provided to you, Jennifer Freeland sent the teachers union members with regard to the attached, the teachers union is recommending that teachers not fill out or submit any forms regarding classroom libraries. We also recommend that teachers do not allow students access to classroom libraries at this time. I find it disturbing how Governor Ron DeSantis and Moms for Liberty was blamed for classroom libraries being closed when it was clearly the union. Moms for Liberty sent an email to the district shortly after this misinformation and offered to volunteer to help these classroom libraries open up for children. There's still no response from the district. The library book's policy and procedures to challenge has received no response from our email to work with the district to improve this process. Also, there was no communication to changing families who didn't fill out the library permission slip form to full access recently. This was done behind closed doors and the public and parents were never notified. I was appointed to the DOE work group for the training for media center specialists and librarians as one of the four parents in this state recommended by multiple people in Florida and proud to serve for this training for the state. I find it disturbing when people tell me that Moms for Liberty is anti-teacher or anti-public school when many of our own children attend this school district. Guess who's standing with the teachers who dare to speak up against the liberal agenda? It's not their liberal co-workers, their school, the liberal union, or the district many times. It's us parent groups and other like-minded teachers. It's not the system that always supports them and their own people turn on them, bully them, vilify them, and we know the truth. Please, if there's any teachers, staff, parents, or admins that we can help in any way, please reach out to us at Moms for Liberty and please stop with the misinformation as we will continue to do public records requests and give you the truth. Thank you. Okay, 
Uh, Michael C. Marsh, IRC Council PTA President, is next. Uh, Mary Dotsey is on deck. Good evening, school board, superintendent, everyone in their respective positions. I am Michael C. Marsh, your proudly present president of our county council PTA, with our 90-day update of what we have done. The work has been good. The opportunities have been great. Let me tell you all about it. Oslo's PTSA, after years, has now been formed. We have over 60 members, amazing teachers and everyone else over there. What are we gonna do at Oslo? We're gonna get a teacher's lounge. PTA is gonna do that. If you guys would like to help, we uh, would love your support. Next, we went over to the amazing Dodger Town and visited the assistant principal Patterson, who they reached out to make certain that Dodger Town was represented this year. When I took office in June, the first thing I said was every school here in the school district of Indian River County will have a PTA. Every school will have a voice. Mrs. Patterson's here in the back. Thank you for coming tonight, ma'am. And what are they doing over there? Collecting new clothes and items with their partnership with the Dodger Town, with their community partnership. Next, we visit the amazing Pelican Island. Tonight, we have Principal Bagley over here. Principal Bagley reached out to make sure that their PTA was rechartered. She knows that there wasn't a new board for the next year. Well, we took care of that. Thank you very much, Principal Bagley. Last but certainly not least, in its first time in history, guess who has a PTA? You guessed it, Indian River Prep. We're going to make sure that it's not the same schools over and over that we hear about. I can promise you that. But if we start with the mission, then we end with the mission, right? So what is the PTA? Why should we have a PTA, right? I mean, I've heard that a couple times, not many but it's to make every child's potential a reality. And how do we do that? By engaging and empowering families and the communities to advocate, you ready for this? Through the chair, Dr. Schiff, for all children. That's what we stand for. We're a 501c3. There's no politics here. For all children. So I implore you, as we see the beautiful Stronger together, now that these PTAs are formed, it's time to get to work. And I once heard by a fearless leader, the work is good, the work will continue to be good, and these opportunities are now out. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna make sure for Thanksgiving that there's meals for everyone in the community. I wanna also thank those and the district and the leadership staff um, from Dr. Moore. We had Ms. Emerson, Mr. Seymour, so many that reached out and said, what can we do for these PTAs? We went to that school, the extravaganza, Dozens of parents, they had no idea it was a county council. I can promise you, in the two years I will be here, and I ain't going nowhere, unless I die, and I'll do it from heaven. But we're gonna make sure that they know there's a county council PTA, whether there's four of us on this board or 10. Thank you very much. Stronger together. Thank you, Dr. Schiff. Okay, next is Mary Dotsey, and on deck is Lamar Notagiacomo. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Dotsey. I work for the school district of Indian River County. I am in the food service department. I'm speaking on support staff that we really need your support. We are not doing well. This inflation is killing us. We are asking for help. Services are coming up. We have Thanksgiving coming up for families. We have Christmas coming up for families. We are the bottom line helpers. I don't mean the bottom line, but we are the people that get the kids to school. We feed the students. If you don't have us, how are the kids gonna learn if there's nobody there to serve them food? We get so much help from the school district, and I ask you guys to help us one more time, to help us right before the holidays. It has been very hard for us as families. I go to the grocery store, I have a family to feed, I'm not making that much money. I'm making $16,000 a year divided by 24, that's $300 a week. That's $600 a paycheck. I'm not bringing home $600 a paycheck. There's a lot of deductions. But when I, my food service ladies are like, Mary, we need help. We're working two and three jobs. I work five days for the school and five days in a fine dining restaurant down on the beach side. Would I like to go out to eat? Absolutely, I'm too tired by the time I get home from work. But what I'm asking for is my food service representation. We are the lowest paid because our salary is split into 24 paychecks and we really need some support. I know that uh, President Biden has sent out a 
information on pandemic and not pandemic, but the inflation. And I'm just asking, you know, I had all this stuff written down. I'm just blinded because I'm just grateful to be up here. I know Dr. Shift, you came to Sebastian River High School when Coach Wilson passed away. Dr. Moore, I see you out and about all the time supporting the staff. I'm just asking as a union member, I'm supporting my food service and transportation, plan operators, nurses, secretaries. We're not surviving, we're not. And I just appreciate your help, thank you. Okay. Uh, Lamar, thank you, but please refrain from clapping. Thank you. Lamar Notajakimo and John Samaratic Tank on deck. Sorry about that. Thank you. I just want to read something that the local media probably won't report because they're very liberal biased. Um, but um, I want to just point out that there was a lawsuit filed against the, the school district of Indian River County School Board and others for the Parents in Education Law and the LGBTQ Administration Guide. It was denied October 20th. And uh, I want to give a little bit more detail about that. Because the plaintiffs have failed to establish standing as to the claims alleged in the first amended complaint and because the first amended complaint constitutes an impermissible shotgun pleading, the court can and will dismiss the first amend amended complaint in its entirety. Nevertheless, since it's not clear that at least some of the plaintiffs cannot establish standing for at least a portion of their claims, the court is inclined to grant plant plaintiffs one more opportunity to file an amended pleading. However, plaintiffs are cautioned that failure to correct the deficiencies noted in 27 uh, and to adequately establish standing as to each plaintiff for each alleged constitutional violation and form of relief may result in the dismissal of this case without further leave to amend. For the reasons set forth herein, it is ordered and adjudged as followed. Plaintiff's motion for preliminary injunction is denied. The first amended complaint is dismissed without prejudice. Done and ordered in Orlando, Florida on October 20th, 2022. Um, and the school board is continues to try to justify putting back the, uh, the pornographic books into the school library, saying that the parents can opt out if they want. How can the parents opt out if they don't know what's in the books? And some of you have tried to state that the books that, that are in the school libraries are a different version than, uh, than the books that, are, uh, that we have personally obtained and, and read. And uh, there are many gross violations. Uh, the books are very dark. And the focus of, of these 100 or so books remaining in the school libraries contain um, rape, incest, um, other forms of depravity that don't belong in children's brains and have no educational value, and they need to be removed. And I just want to thank Jackie Rosario for standing up strongly for parental rights, and I would urge the rest of the board to do the same. Thank you. Okay, uh, John, is it an O at the end of your name? All right, Sam Samaritano. All right, looks like a C, sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am, uh, thank you board for being here. John Samaritano, I'm an Indian River County resident, taxpayer, and father to a teenager in the high school. Um, I wanted to share with the board, and especially Mrs. Rosario, why I will be voting for Ms. Rosario this upcoming go around. Uh, the last time that I checked out a meeting here, it was when we had that big controversial policy that was set forth that parents didn't know about it, the public didn't know about it, and even some board members didn't know about it. And at that meeting, Mrs. Rosario had made the statement that the way these policies need to be enacted is they need to be presented to the board by the superintendent. The board should have a discussion about those policies then that discussion should be sent to open a forum for parents to talk about it and give the opinion to the board. And then at that point, the board comes to a conclusion and votes and decides how the board would like the superintendent to move forward with those policies. Um, I full, fully support that system. I feel like that's one of the main functions of a board to kind of put some guide towards a superintendent. Uh, but really, I was shocked when one of uh, your colleagues, Ms. Rosario, another board member said, uh, and don't, this isn't a quote, it's not verbatim, but it went something along the lines of, well, you know, if we had to review every policy 
that the superintendent wants to implement, do you know how long that would take? And it would kind of be like micromanaging him. Well, listen, for $37,000 a year or $34,000 a year, whatever you guys make up there, taxpayers don't want to hear that. Four or five years ago, we had a sitting board member who said that she didn't like meetings going past 9 p.m. at night because when they go past 9 p.m. or night, her two children at home didn't have mom to say goodnight to. Well, you know what? If you don't want to put in the effort and the hours to do the job that, yes, Mr. Rosario, your uh, constituents voted you in to do and that taxpayers are paying you for, then perhaps you should think about stepping down, giving up that $37,000 a year, and letting somebody else who will put in the work and hours sit up there instead of you. Now, that's not the reason why I'm voting for you, Mr. Rosario. The reason why I voted for you, and it's not because you're endorsed by Moms for Liberty or you take pictures with Ron DeSantis or you wave a Republican or a Democrat flag, no. I'm voting for her because she said, as a rebuttal to that, she said, it doesn't matter if it takes me an extra, uh, extra meeting a month, two or three extra meetings a month, whatever it takes to get it done, she was willing to do. That's why you have my vote. And for those of you up for re-election, please consider that very much so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, did you want to speak to anything? Okay, I, I would like to address a couple of things. First of all, um, during a workshop, board members can discuss and say whatever they think. Um, and I don't speak for a representative, and I never will. I will never put a representative's words in my mouth, and I won't tell people how my husband's job is affecting what he does, and I don't appreciate that being said. And since it was directed at me by my opponent, I have a right to say a rebuttal to that, and I will. Um, as far as the books being held up, there were comic versions of books that were held up with pictures. Those are not in our schools, the one that was held up over and over and over again in our meeting. That was what was referred to by this board member. We did not have that book. Uh, sir, policies, absolutely, we need to read all policies. Procedures, I think, was the discussion that night. That was, what, procedures are a little different than policies. Um, the superintendent sets procedures all day long, all the time for all kinds of employees. Um, I think that's the part that maybe is a little different and I'd be happy to speak to you about what the procedures are versus policies, just so you know. Okay, do you want to speak to anything? Okay, so I need, yes. I want to oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Moron, the one um, citizen who talked about um, parent volunteers, I know you were talking oh. about some changes in that, and I dealt with that um, with the parent at Tr uh, Treasure Coast Elementary, so do you want to share a little bit about that? Through the chair, Craig, and that's part of the need for the revisions, the way the policy is written, it is unclear, and the reality is we do not want to have a policy that impedes the opportunity for a parent to serve on a field trip. So there are opportunities to clarify what that specific process was. Um, there was also information out there um, that was incorrect and shouldn't have been out there regarding a, a drug test to, to do that. So we need to be very specific and to the point regarding what a volunteer is how they check in and maximize the opportunities for students or parents to participate. And I think with those revisions, we'll be able to capture that. Great, I just don't want anyone not going because of cost. And the other one was just a thank you to Mr. Marsh for getting our PTSAs going, especially our new ones at Oslo, um, Indian River Prep, and then uh, Dodger Town and Pelican Island kind of um, recharting those again to make their movement on that. So thank you very much. I think it's very, very important, and uh, please keep us informed on what they need. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I would like to. Um, I just wanted to reiterate um, the 91, uh, the 9,200, the volunteers. Um, Dr. Moore is, I mean, I know that it was just stated, but it is incredibly important that we get it right, and I know, I see Mrs. Dampierre's head um, shaking and you you're right on the messaging um, the messaging needs to be the same with regards to this we do not want to impede parental involvement we certainly want to do as much as we can to get parents involved in this in the schools so I, I have every confidence that we're going to be able to review this um, as a board and when the superintendent brings it back to us it will be done right so thank you for that I also want to just um, before thank you for that that took me by surprise um, I appreciate that very much. Um, I will say, though, as a 
when you follow up with Mrs. Barenborg, keep in mind we have a policy um, that I am trying to pull up right now, which right now it was too quick for me to get, uh, but we have a policy that says with regard to procedures, if a procedure is tied to a policy, if a procedure is tied to policy or statute, it has to come to the board for a vote. It has to come to the board for our opinion on it and it has to come to us for a vote and for adoption. So other day-to-day -day operations, the superintendent is fully um, at um, uh, not only just capable, but it is in his purview and in his work uh, responsibilities to take care of those. Anything else that is tied to policy, that is, con that is uh, tied to law, state law or any other law, it has to come to us for, uh, for adoption. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Um, one other thing I will say about the policy 9200, um, we did all, I don't know about the other board members, but we did discuss that ahead of time. That's part of why it was pulled before the meeting. So I don't know if you didn't know it was going to be pulled before the meeting, but there were some concerns because others had the same concern you do. So we appreciate you bringing that to our attention. All right. I'd like to call for a motion to approve consent agenda items. So moved. Second. Sorry, who did that? Mr. Mr. Barefoot and me. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> Passes 5-0. All right. Items were pulled from consent to action. So I have item 10A that I pulled. I'll have Mr. Bass present that item to you, Madam Chair. Okay. Yes, good evening to the chair. Uh, this was the item that was brought to you about um, leasing out a 50 by 50 foot section to Singulaire for a cell tower uh, to be placed in the southeast corner, I had to get my directions right, southeast corner uh, back of Treasure Coast Elementary. Um, in discussion, uh, we probably need to go back and do a little more research here just to make sure that it's, uh, it's feasible and it's safe uh, in researching uh, initially. The research shows that um, 150 feet uh, from the tower is the recommended distance uh, to have people in that area. Uh, this is roughly 590 feet from it, but just to be safe, we're going to go back and, and, and double check this and make sure and also uh, look at the stipulations of the agreement one more time and compare with another uh, municipality to ensure that we are uh, if we move forward with this, we are getting the amount that we should be getting monthly. Yeah, uh, thank you. There were two concerns that I had. One was um, making sure that students' health is always number one. Um, you know, there have been some studies on cell, cell towers before. Um, when we, this first was brought up, I thought it was on a piece of property. It wasn't as close to a school, so I, I pulled it for that reason. The second reason is because I know about the um, little, um, I won't say dispute, but little interesting back and forth between the county and the city over a cell tower a couple years ago and um, the amount of money that actually can be made off of a cell tower and renting out what's on that tower. So I want us to make sure that we're either we're making sure kids are healthy and we're getting the best bang for our buck. Okay. Anything else, board members? That's why I pulled the item. So we're going to bring it back um, in, in a month or two. Okay. All right. Moving on. So uh, because I, I pulled that item, sorry, I need to go back and vote for the uh, amended. You have an am amended item, too. No, I, I pulled it, so therefore it's, you're good to vote on that. OK. You pulled the 10A, you didn't, and you pulled the other item. 10A is the item in which is on the floor right now. That's the item we're discussing. Right. And, right. and in that discussion, we need to take a vote. We right. need to vote That's it up or vote it down. Going. Okay, right. I heard you clear your throat, so I didn't know if you had another one. No. Okay, no. thank you. Let me clear All right. My throat. Yep. So <laughs> I'd like to call for a vote. Um, I need to vote on uh, the pulled item consent to action. So, uh, any discussion? All, All those in favor? I'm, are you adding any? Are you asking? You I just pulled, wanted to have I pulled the, the item, so um, therefore I need to discuss. We voted on the consent. I just pulled this item, I brought it up for discussion. I'm telling you that we're going to vote on it next month, so um, we're going to look bring it back next month. So in other words, we have to vote on the fact that we're going to bring it back next month. That's what we're voting okay. on. 
Okay. So moved. I'm okay right. with that. Second. Dr. Jones, second? Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, 5 0 on that. All right. Are we good? Yes, we are. Okay. Action I, agenda number 12. Superintendent, this is yours. That, that, that's the NEOLA policies. A, we got to read and adopt the policies. Okay. All right. On August 29, 2022, the school board moved approval to set a public hearing date to adopt new, revised, and repealed district school board policies. The purpose of the revisions, new policies, and repealed policies is to be consistent with pre present practice and legislation. The policy change process was followed in accordance with Florida statutes under Florida Administration Procedures Act, Chapter 20 rulemaking and school board bylaw 0131. This item deals with adoption of NEOLA policies, volume 23, number one, and special update of 829-2022. Dr. Moore, have you documented that this public hearing was properly advertised in accordance with state statutes? I have. We now recess this meeting to conduct the public hearing as advertised. The public hearing is now session. Dr. Moore, are there any written responses to the advertised public hearing to be read at this time? Not at this time. Okay. The public is invited to address this issue at this time. Is there an individual representing an organization or on his own personal or public interest who wishes to speak? No, it has to be on the one that we're discuss discussing. Okay. All right. Um, the chair concludes that the announced public hearing on the adoption of NEOLA policies, volume 23, number one, and special update of 829-2022 has been conducted pursuant to notice, and the ample opportunity to address this issue has been provided to all. The board meeting will reconvene at this time. I'd like to call for a motion. So moved. Second. Dr. Schiff. Mr. Barefoot. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes 5-0. Okay, second item, 12, action agenda. Approval of school board of <coughs> Indian River County resolution 2023-07 for disposal of real property. Florida Department of Transportation right away acquisition. Through the chair, Mr. Bass will present that item. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Through the chair, this is a piece of property that is on the northeast sliver of uh, Treasure Coast Elementary's campus. It is uh, 1,631 square feet. That is 0.313 acres. Uh, Department of Transportation is going to come in and do work on uh, County Road 510 and during that work they are going to extend a sidewalk on the south side of 510 and by having to do this they are going to need to encroach on the property that we presently own so they have made this proposal uh, the proposal for this piece of property is two hundred eighty one thousand four hundred dollars um, this will uh, cover the cost of the property also, it would cover uh, any improvements that we need to do to this little section of land as a result of, of them coming in and, and, and extending this sidewalk and also for uh, any real estate damages. Um, Mr. Westenberger and his team, we work together uh, to negotiate this, this amount. We feel that it is a very fair amount um, and we'll you know, uh, request that uh, we approve this and move forward with it. I'd like to call for a motion. So move. Dr. Jones, Dr. Schiff. Okay, I'm gonna ask Ms. Esplin for a roll call vote. Ms. Esplin will announce a vote. Mr. Barefoot. Aye, uh, yes. Dr. Schiff. Aye. Ms. Rosario. Aye. Dr. Jones. Aye. Mrs. Barenborg. Aye. It passes 5-0. Okay, thank you. All right, we are to the superintendent's report. Maturity, yay. All right. We have no discussion items at this time, so we're going to move to school board member matters. Um, Dr. Schiff, I'm going to ask you to go last. So, uh, Mr. Barefoot, would you I, like to go? I have, I have nothing. Nothing. Okay. 
Uh, Dr. Jones? I've got a few, thank you. First of all, I want to give this, Ms. Berenborg, to you. Thank you for making collection on the water for the uh, Thanksgiving uh, homeless. And um, the school choice extravaganza was absolutely wonderful. Thank you to Ms. Emerson, Dr. Moore, and all the district staff. We have MCAN leadership, MCAN meeting this week. Uh, thank you to Learning Alliance for all that they do in support of our schools. Um, I'm on the scholarship committee for Wilson Golf Tournament. We had a few people there, Mr. Seymour, Mr. Bass, raising money for scholarship for Vero Beach High School and Sebastian River High School students in honor of Coach Wilson and Mr. Billy Wilson. Um, I'm serving on the federal platform um, with the FSBA, and they just sent out some drafts on the state legislative platform and federal one. And just let me read the topics really quickly for federal. This is a draft, we, the starting number one was mental health. Number two is connectivity, that's with everyone having learning um, with the internet across the state, uh, making sure that the IDEA Act is fully funded, cybersecurity, and summer learning. Now for the state, mental health again, number one, looking at workforce, career paths available for children, personnel recruitment and retention, and then, of course, we always go back to funding. And I think that draft was just sent by Daniel Thomas um, just right before our meeting. Um, United Against Poverty, uh, four board members were there. I think we all had a good time and learned some things. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Ms. Baraborg and bagging groceries there. And I uh, see Ms. Wendy here. That was a great experience for us. It's a great experience meeting our people there and talking to the people who work there on a regular basis. So very important for our community, and I thank you. Um, Day of Caring, that was wonderful. We started at the Citrus Bowl, and then headed out to our um, spots where we wanted to help. And I think that Meredith from United Way said there, Dr. Moore, I forget how many projects, but over 50, I'm for sure. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, you know, this has been in our, um, consent agenda, and, and we see this with teacher pay, and, and we listen to people and how hard it is struggling to make things meet. You know, Florida is still considered, depending on what uh, survey you look at, as far as teachers being in the bottom 10 or the bottom five. So we're struggling not only with that, and I know our district really does its best as far as trying to compress that salary schedule, but we just have to remember that, um, you know, People are hurting right now, and we need to continually look at that to see what we can do for our support staff and for our teachers. Um, Dr. Moore, just a, a little bit. I was going to bring this as discussion, but I thought it'd be better. Um, I, I want parents, when will the school improvement plans be updated? I mean, we approved them tonight. When will those go on the website? Through the chair, frozen so the board can approve them, um, but they are living, breathing documents. And as we, we discussed earlier, the, the amount of work under the leadership of Ms. Becerra and team really has transformed what those plans look like. They truly are documents that are not only driving school site specific work, but ultimately the district support team is also 100% aligned to that, their, their school improvement plans. I just encourage parents um, when you can and when they are on the website or even at the schools to please take a look at them. I think the narratives will give you a really good idea of what's going on at the schools. This school improvement process that I've seen is more in tune uh, than with the state requirements. I think this is a living document, as you just said, looking at the data. What can we do? What are some issues that we need to address? So um, when you look at the early warning indicators, you know, we're stressing attendance this year. And I think it's Rosewood Magnet has been the winner in elementary every, every week or two weeks. But um, it's so, so important, that, that teacher engagement, that student learning. And when you look at the high yield strategies and what we're looking at for differentiated instruction. I mean, when I had the school improvement plan, you'd write it. You didn't have this data to take a look at it. You just didn't have this ongoing data. So you were shooting from the hip at the end of the year with FCAT scores. Now they're looking at it. Principals are talking to one another about it, um, mentoring one another on it, and uh, I think that's really good. So I just, you know, maybe we can talk about that. And one thing I'm probably gonna ask for the next workshop, Dr. Morris, you know, I keep reading all of these reports about because of the pandemic. 
in uh, our nation, not just our school district or not our state, we've got some real catching up to do. And I just really want to come out of the box on that. What can we do, especially in math, to help our students? I mean. And we will bring, to the chair, we'll be bringing our quarterly update in December, uh, which will address a lot of, of that concern and so much more. And just one last thing, it says the first national assessment of student achievement in three years revealed the largest math score declines among fourth and eighth grader, eighth graders since the initial trial assessment in 1990. So we've just, you know, we've got to really look at what we can do. Not just summer slide, but slide in general. So, and, and that's why we're here. So thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Ms. Rosario. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, similar uh, events as um, Dr. Jones just mentioned, obviously United Way, Day of Caring uh, was a wonderful opportunity to give back and to donate. Um, I just want to pivot a little bit to Dr. Moore and give him the mic um, and maybe or maybe even Mr. Bass and Mr. Seymour who took a drive all the way to Lee County and actually delivered a truckload of items that were donated, two truckloads, two truckloads um, uh, that the community donated for schools who were impacted, directly impacted because of uh, Hurricane Ian. So I don't know who wants to take I'll the mic on that. I'll let Mr. Bass, set, I'll give just two seconds. Um, yeah, they were able to deliver those materials last year. And as I said at the last meeting, our goal was to put them directly in the hands of, of those students. And Mr. Bass was able to um, make some connections in order to ensure that was happening. So he can kind of give us the details on how we made that happen. Yes, sir, Dr. Moore, thank you. Uh, through the board, um, after when the storm hit, um, it, well, first let me back up. My, my experience of being in another school district and in 2006 and then in 2018 being significantly impacted by a hurricane, um, it, it is, really tremendous when the school district receives support from other communities, other school districts, and it really helps you get through those times. However, when, when you go through something like that, you get this initial flow of, of, of supplies, and then after the smoke clears, it's like, wow, we have all this stuff, but this isn't really what we need. We need more specific things. So in, in talking to Dr. Moore, we decided that we would reach out to um, a group in, in Southwest Florida to get specifically what the community needed. Uh, we went through the um, uh, Southwest Florida Community Foundation, and they have a subgroup from that called Future Makers Coalition. And uh, in my time in Glades County, I was a member of the Future Makers Coalition and knew exactly who we needed to contact to ensure that these uh, supplies got to the students and, and the schools that needed them. Um, so, you know, we, all of our schools collected supplies. We had the day of caring where the community brought things in. Um, Mr. Seymour and I took a uh, the district box truck, which uh, if you haven't driven a <laughs> F550 with about eight pallets of, of goods in it, you should, everybody should try to do that once or twice in their life. And then uh, Mr. Seymour was in one of the transit vans, which I still don't think the seat would go back far enough for him <laughs> to not be curled up in it. But we, we, we made it over. We left at 5 o'clock uh, Thursday morning, uh, got there, what, about 9.30 or so. Uh, Lee County School System. Uh, their employees were thrilled that they, they were there. Southwest Florida Community Foundation was there. Uh, Lee County um, Education Foundation uh, staff were there and took about 30 minutes, got everything unloaded. Um, they, it happened to be the very first day that some of the students by the impacted schools were back in session that day. Um, the three specific schools that these goods were going, these supplies were going to, was uh, Pine Island Elementary, Sanibel Elementary, and, and most importantly, Fort Myers Beach Elementary, which, you know, in addition to losing the, the entire facilities, they lost everything that went inside those facilities. Um, so it was, it was a feeling, and I know Mr. Seymour will feel the same way, it was a feeling that even though we were just the ones driving it over, it was such a rewarding feeling knowing that we were giving and so much to this community um, because, believe me, they, you know, I was a recipient of their help 
in two other times, and it felt really good to give back to them. And, you know, in, in talking to their staff, you know, they were just grateful. And I said, you know, hopefully, knock on wood, that we are never impacted by a storm like that. But if we are, you know, it, it, it does well to pay it forward. And I know that they would be right there to help us too. So, you know, it, it was a great feeling. So yeah, I'm just thankful to have the opportunity to be the one to deliver that. I'd just like to say too, um, it's a testament to you all and your beliefs and this county and what a great county we live in. Also, i uh, like to thank uh, Kristen Maddox and, and Dr. Jacobs who had their family out early that morning. It took us about maybe two hours to gather quite a few materials. And not only materials, as Mr. Bass stated, these are items that are needed within the classroom. So it's not items that you can always go and buy and pick up everywhere else, but it will definitely benefit our, the students in that county. In addition to that, talking to some of the members there, knowing that they are not there yet and they're gonna need a lot more support, they mentioned that there are almost 100 teachers without a place to stay. So we know that they are truly devastated at this point in time and they need our prayers. In addition to that, going into the area knowing that we were not that close to ground zero, you can tell that they were hit pretty hard and it's a lot that they're gonna to have to recover from, but thank you to Indian River County. They do feel a little bit better about their current situation. Thank you all. That's awesome, thank you so much. Um, it's really humbling uh, and I'm glad that we were able to do that and I, I thank you both for taking out of your personal time to make that trip or work time, I'm not sure which time it was, but either way, thank you for making the trip. Um, I appreciate that. Um, with that said, um, uh, the same thing with regard to uh, SDIRC school choice extravaganza. I think uh, it's no secret how I feel about school choice and um, every year it seems to get bigger and better and uh, it makes me happy to see. Um, it may, I know that um, this year was much bigger than last year um, and next year is gonna be even bigger than, than this year. So I'm excited uh, about that. Um, I don't want us to lose momentum on school choice and uh, themes that schools, um, you know, special programs that each individual school has to offer. Um, so I want us to keep moving in that direction. Uh, United Against Poverty uh, Elected Officials Day was wonderful. Um, it, it truly was an opportunity for us to uh, learn about the growth and the expansion of uh, United Against Poverty and all of their programs. So it was wonderful. Um, just as uh, Dr. Jones said that she was uh, bagging food, I think you said, um, I was in the food, uh, the food pantry and the clothes closet. Um, and then um, it was just, just wonderful to be able to help. So um, we're happy to have them in the, in the community and glad to be uh, in partnership with United Against Poverty um, and whatever other events they may have um, in the future, it'd be lovely to be a part of. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, school choice extravaganza. Wow. Um, I brought my daughter and my three-year-old grandson who I told my daughter, you know, you need to start looking at schools and although he's three years away from entering school. Uh, his takeaway from a three-year-old the later that night when his dad got home was, could I have a robot for Christmas? <laughs> so um, it, it made an impression on him, obviously. It was wonderful. Uh, board members, I sent you an email because in the past we've had, um, you know, just like we went and helped out a community that was devastated by hurricanes, we have helped out our own community last year with homeless um, water that was about to be expired was donated to um, Team Success Thanksgiving dinner, and they were able to feed 800 people. This year, they're hoping to feed 1,000. And um, I've asked since there was an issue about the water last year, I believe it was called Watergate at some point, um, I asked if you would make a donation as a board member, um, kindly consider $25 and uh, we'll donate that for the water so that the school district isn't donating the water this year. Um, Up With Poverty was a wonderful event. Thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed bagging groceries mm -hmm. and um, I will say I had a woman come and cry on my shoulder. The first time she had been there getting groceries and said she never realized in her life that she would be having to do that. Um, and I told her, 
this is dignity. This is a hand up, not a hand out. And she felt so much better about what that place is offering instead of a handout. So we appreciate that, everything that Up Center does. Um, United Way, not only was the day of carrying wonderful, I know Doc and I were there to help um, with the supply drive and um, collect things. It was amazing to me how many schools gathered um, PTA people together and donated things from their school, and um, as well as just people from the community came up, and even at the last second, we're hoping that they could make it to the truck, so we appreciate that. Um, the annual awards breakfast for the United Way I attended the, this last week, that was quite oh, was fun, interesting. Yeah. And yeah. one of the awards that was given was to uh, Dodgertown Elementary's, is it Child Care Resources or Child Care Services? Was it Treasure Coast Community Health at Dodgertown? Well, yeah, the Community Health wasn't the group though that got the okay. award. Um, so they got an award for outstanding partnership, but it was partnership with the school district and what, what we do at Dodgertown. So that was um, a really nice note. The, the speaker for the event spoke on workforce housing and it was really true to my heart about what we're trying to do here to help teachers and help um, people have an affordable place to live but also he brought up homeless families and we're not tapping in as much as we probably could to some of the money that's out there for the states. I've already contacted the gentleman and um, already got a hold of somebody in Tallahassee. We're setting up a, a discussion on Friday uh, with Ms. Mallets and we're hoping to move forward with the housing uh, funding for our families that are um, in that situation that are homeless. So I'll let you know where that, that moves. Also, I attended the vaping awareness with the um, substance abuse council that we had at Vero Beach High School. I walked into the PAC, which is the Vero Beach Performing Arts Center. How many people does that seat? About 800. 800, okay. Sebastian's 1,100. There were probably eight people in the audience. It was sad. Um, because I don't think, I'm not sure why, but I, I don't think people are aware how scary vaping is for kids. And the speaker they had was a doctor, and it was eye-opening for me, and I, I learned a lot about vaping in the last two years, but uh, this doctor really brought some really interesting information. They filmed it, and uh, it's available for us if we could use it. I would love for parents to be able to get a hold of that and see what he presented because it's an eye-opener. The parents, a few parents that were there were shocked and said, what can we do to get more people this information? It was kind of sad. Um, I know there were other events in town that night. I guess there was something at Walking Tree, and um, I was hoping that more board members would, would have come to the vaping awareness instead of to other events, but I understand, you know, we all have priorities, I get that. We're all also at lots of different events all the time, so I understand how much you get pulled in different directions. As far as the school improvement plans, uh, I've had lots of conversation with uh, Ms. Beishura about those. I'm very aware of how those are written and having written one myself several times, they are moving in the right direction. We're not there yet. Uh, you know my concerns and um, hopefully we will, we will get in the right direction and um, make sure that we have all the right people in place for all those, those SAC teams to be able to do what they need to do for kids. And also the, the alignment to the um, to the strategic plan and to the African American Achievement Plan is noted. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you. All right, Dr. Schiff, it's all you. Thank you. Thanks for giving me the last word on my last <laughs> night. Um, everybody's mentioned United Against Poverty. Um, again, I want to shout out to Wendy McDaniel, not only for putting on that event, but for how gracious you were to everyone who attended, to every official who was there, irrespective of what they represented, who they were supported by or for or against. Wendy, you were a consummate professional, and I thank you for that. Um, my time's gonna free up a little bit, in a bit, so hit me up because I could be looking for things to do. <laughs> you, can you can bag groceries. I can do any number of Those things. Those are fun. Uh, I'm also getting off another board, so my time is, is really gonna free up. Um, to Ms. Dotsy, Mrs. Dotsy's comment, um, and you brought this up, Dr. Jones, um, 16,000 is unlivable. It is, it's unlivable 
in a county like this. And were I to be continuing on this board, I would be championing that issue. So I hope that this board will take that on. I know how difficult it is to do these negotiations. I've been involved with them for years, uh, but that's not a livable wage um, in, in almost any place and certainly not here. Um, I was reading something on social media the other day about somebody whose rent is increasing uh, to $2,200 a month. It's impossible, you, ca you can't function here. So I hope that that's something that this board will take very seriously moving forward. And uh, Ms. Dotsey, if you are listening, um, I hope I'll be able to support advocating for that in some way. Um, I also attended the uh, Florida, uh, online, there was a Florida Department of Education media work group. I was online for that as well, and I listened to those comments. One of the things that I became aware of in that is that when school board members or other public officials attend those meetings, it's important that we identify ourselves as school board members and that we are speaking either as a private person or as a school board member and not representing the entire board. The other thing about that that I would um, have school board members be conscious of moving forward is that if a school board member speaks at a public meeting like that and another school board member is there, if that other public, if that other school board member speaks about something that will come before the board, it is potentially a sunshine violation. It's really important to be really conscious and cautious about that because we can get ourselves into trouble unwittingly on things that are in public spaces that could come before the board. So I'd advise us all, please, moving forward, well, you all, not me, moving <laughs> forward, um, to be very conscious of the spaces in which you speak when other board members are there and that meeting is not publicly noticed as a public discussion. Um, fourth, uh, Doc Jones, thank you for bringing Coach Wilson into the space just now. Uh, when I was running for office, he made a real point to reach out to me, to befriend me, to support me, um, and he was very special in my time here. Um, and he said the same thing to me about you, and I said the same thing back to him. So I'm, I am, um, I am equally grateful for your service and his wise words um, about how we would learn to interact with each other. So thank you for that. Uh, team, oh yeah, team success. Um, on that, Mrs. Barenborg, um, I not only have a check for you, it's not for $25, it's for $108. Let them buy however much water and other things that they need. Um, if anybody looks it up, 108 is a significant number in a variety of uh, religious and spiritual context, so please look that up. Um, and I volunteered for that event last year, and I intend to volunteer for it again. So here's that. Well, I'll give that to you in a minute. Thank you. And then um, just lastly, this uh, as I close down this meeting, which I think it's about that time, and I get to have the final words of it, thank you. Um, this experience has been profoundly transformative. This experience has transformed every molecule in my body. What I take away from that is not only the person that I've become through this, but the relationships that I've developed. Oh, now I'm gonna get mushy. Um, because really, what this is, is it's about the relationships. We have policies, we have procedures, we have actions, we have academics, we have achievements, we have all kinds of things that we can talk about that, about. But the foundation of every single thing we do in this district, we do in our lives, is fundamentally about our relationships. And I cannot say that strongly enough. If we do not have and build those relationships, then the rest is meaningless. So to everybody in this district, um, since I first came here as a consultant in 2014, to everybody in this district with whom I've had a relationship, you have made a profound impact on me and on my life and on everything that I do. And I'm looking at some of you in the room. I would look at all of you who are watching this. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how deeply I am affected by every single conversation I've had with every single one of you. And I thank you for the time and the effort and the heart that you put into every single communication we had. So on that, um, au revoir, adios. <laughs> Shalom, namaste, peace out, shift out. Peace out. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. All right, with that, we'll adjourn at 719.